How does this often play out in the real world? Well, let me show you over here. I've marked it up on the wall. And what it means is, is that steel over there is going to have to move back to this point here. It's not just that steel, it's all the steel, right the way along the front. Funding for this old house is provided by Parks Corporation, makers of safe and simple, environmentally responsible stains and finishes that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by State Farm Insurance, keeping our promise of protection with auto, home, life, and health insurance. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hi, I'm Steve Thomas, and welcome back to this old house in London. And those of you who were with us last time remember that we have a big problem on this project. The local planning authority, which controls all architectural changes to any building on this street, in fact, the whole district, had issued a stop work notice, meaning that we could not proceed with the front facade until they could review our plans, which could take weeks. Now, fortunately, we got them down here last week. They looked it over, and they gave us three options, all of them difficult and all of them expensive. That's the bad news. The good news is that we've got a delivery from America. David? Hi, Steve. Are these the food parcels? They are. It's the Russian beef. <laughs> we've shipped them back to you. Actually, it's the latest issue of High Technology Windows. All oh, right. I hope they're going to fit in aesthetically with the um, with our building. They are indeed. It's they are true divided lights, and we'll unpack them upstairs. But first, let's horse them off the truck. Great. We'll open up, Charlie. Let's get them down. Well, I'm impressed, Steve. Do you mean to say you had all of these shipped over by air all the way from America? You said you needed them right away. Well, that's fast. I wish everything arrived that quickly. We deliver all our building materials this way, David, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right, guys. Hey, David. Rock lab. Plaster going on there. Wiring. You're moving right along. Yeah, we've practically got the first fix of wiring completed now. First fix. Hey, Norm. Hey, Steve. In a bit of a pickle, aren't we? Yeah. You know, I hate to see a job go backwards, but that's what's happened. The wall that was here last time is removed, and some major changes are going to have to happen to the structural steel. Hmm. So, David, could you sort of lay the whole situation out for us, please? Well, what happened three days ago, the head of design from the council came up to have a look at what we've been doing. And he basically, he looked at the, the vertical front and didn't like it, and he's insisting on a traditional mansard structure. What does that look like? Let me show you over here. Uh, we have the street level here yeah. and the front of the building here. And at the top, we've got a parapet wall. And then what we've been building is our vertical front right. with a flat deck. Now, he wants a mansard look, which means that we've got to have an angle at the front here. Uh, that's got to be nine inches to make it look correct. This space here. That's right. At the gutter. Now, if I drop from my existing header, a line down to that point there, right. I get 82 degrees. He's insisting on 72 degrees. I mean, isn't that a little bit nitpicky? That's what he will approve, and that's what the Historic Society says. Now, the only way he'll accept 82 degrees is if we put another roof structure up on top of our roof with a 22-degree pitch. Another roof structure on top of the existing roof just for looks. That's right, and of course it will ruin the use of the flat deck up, up, up there. Hmm. Any other alternatives? Well, what we're going to have to do is, without that, we're going to have to take back our header about two foot to get our angle of 72 degrees. How does this option play out in the real world? Well, let me show you over here. I've marked it up on the wall, and what it means is, is that steel over there is going to have to move back to this point here. Well, it's not just that steel, it's all the steel. Right the way along the front. How are we going to do that, Norm? Oh, Steve, it's a lot of different disciplines that have to be involved in doing this. The engineer has to make his calculations because both of these posts are going to be removed. He'll have to design new steel and spec that. Uh, the carpenters are going to have to come in and shore up all this you know, roof that's mm -hmm. already framed. And we can't shore it up right along the middle of the floor because the guy down below has plastered. So that means additional shoring against this outside wall. Then 
it can be removed, but you still got to come back and cut all these joists, remove the existing header, have the mason come in and you know cut a new pocket in the wall and mud it up. It's just a lot of labor. Plus, do you need a crane? Yeah, we'll need, <laughs> a, crane. need a crane. These again. are heavy guys, and we're going to have the crane to bring the new uh, steels up and take the old ones back down again. You're talking a huge job here. Yeah. Another problem I see is that down here, you've already ordered a new kitchen that's going to go into this space, and now you're changing the front wall. Well, yes, and here in the kitchen was a tall fridge freezer unit with a uh, cabinet above it. Mm -hmm. But what we've worked out is that I think we're going to clear the fridge freezer, and we'll have to ask the manufacturers to reshape the cabinet above. Mm. Now, how much is this whole job going to cost, Evan? Well, it's going to be about an extra 5,000 pounds on the budget. Mm -hmm. You mentioned another option, which is to build an additional structure on top of the roof. I, I suppose similar yeah, like to that, that one there. That's right. Now, wouldn't that be faster and cheaper in the long run? It may be a bit faster, but I'm not sure about cheaper, because they may well insist on natural slate, and there's a lot of slate on that secondary roof, mm. and it probably work out about the same sort of price. Mm. So how do we get into this mess? Well, uh, we were advised originally that the, 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 the design of a vertical front has a 95% chance of success. Um, by the architect. By the architect, and that's not proved the case. Um, in addition, we've earned a lot of pressure from the homeowner to get the job done as quickly as possible. And he's paying £2,000 a month interest mm -hmm. while he's not living here. And in addition to that, of course, he's paying rent mm -hmm. until he moves in. Mm. Does this happen all the time, Norm? Well, Steve, you know, it's not unheard of. I mean, if you think back a couple of years ago when we were doing the barn, a concerned citizen didn't think what we were doing was proper and mm -hmm. slowed things down. And last year, or just recently in Wayland, we had to go before the architectural people for the windows and doors we wanted to put in. Mm -hmm. We had to go to a special hearing to have the color of the house p approved. And I can tell you of numerous jobs where I've had to deal with building too close to uh, wetlands or in floodplains, and all these things take time. You know, it's weeks, months sometimes. But we've never had to tear down before. Well, this is the first time we've had to tear something out, but it happens. Not all bad news, though, is it, David? Well, no. I mean, the frustrating thing is that we're doing really well at the back of the building here. Well, it does my heart good to see some plaster going on in the master bedroom. It is good, isn't it? This is Phil, our, our main plasterer. Hey, Phil. And he's putting on a, uh, in fact, it's two coats, but it goes on, and wet, both coats go on wet at the same time, to about an eighth of an inch thick. Over a plasterboard substrate. It's what yeah. we would call veneer plaster, skim coat, but right. yours is brown and ours is usually white. Well, it, it uh, dries out to a sort of pink finish and obviously intended mm -hmm. to be painted after that. Well, it looks great. Won't be long, will it? Well, I hope not. <laughs> What's happening down here in our soon-to-be-completed staircase? Well, we've got a touch of dry rot here, which is not uncommon in buildings this age. And this is Pete Chivers from oh, the see. treatment company. Hello, Pete. Well, dry rot in the States usually affects a timber building, and here we have a masonry building. Well, dry rot starts in timber, and once it's got a hold, it throws spores out. Now, it probably started below this level, mm -hmm. and the spores will travel along the brickwork, between the brick and the plaster, mm -hmm. and so can transfer the dry rot from one floor to another. And it's looking for fresh timber to mm -hmm. attack. Is it damaging? Extremely damaging. When it finds the timber, it extracts all the moisture from it, and the timber just crumbles. I mm -hmm. mean, buildings fall down because mm. of it. Now, has the rest of our building been attended to? Yeah, this is the last area. It is. And, and what's the treatment? Well, holes are drilled every three courses, and the chemical is pumped in, and that chemical provides a barrier and kills off all the dry rot. Mm -hmm. Is it costly? This area will cost you 400 pound, but you get a 30-year guarantee. Ah, 30-year guarantee. I feel better. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Pete. Can I buy you a tea? I hate tea. Ah, tea. What a civilized beverage. While disaster has struck here at Pembridge Place, Norm and I have been doing a bit of touring elsewhere on the Scepter Dial. Isn't this always the way you imagine the English countryside to look? It's absolutely beautiful. I wish I knew how to paint. I would have brought along <laughs> some watercolors to take in this great scene. Hey, but we are on assignment. We're in Northamptonshire, only about 60 miles north of London, and we've got a mission. Yours? I'm going to meet up with Simon Saunders, 
who I'm told has some workshops and storage rooms. And some of them are filled with architectural remnants. And hopefully he's going to lead me to some columns that I can use to conceal those posts back at the flat. Right. Now, while you're doing that, I'm supposed to meet up with Simon's dad, Ted, who's going to show me a house that he's been restoring, parts of which date back to the 11th century. So let's get going. Okay. Well, Simon, this is a very picturesque site. All these big brick buildings lined up along this canal. What's it all about? Well, it was built at about the turn of the 19th century in case Napoleon managed to invade England. King George was going to come up here and run the country from this spot. It was his arsenal, barrack de men here. There was an equestrian school up the top and palaces over where they've now knocked them, well, they knocked them down a few years ago and built houses. And how did you get a hold of it? We bought it about three years ago. Uh, makes wonderful home for our showrooms and workshops. And you know why I'm here. I want to see some columns. Where are they? That's right. Come with me. I think we might have what you're looking for in here, Norm. Oh, this is great, Simon. You've got all kinds of things in here. Yeah, we, we have a pretty wide stock, actually. Sort of carry everything. Wow. What's this, a set of old doors? Yeah, they came out of a castle in Spain, those ones. A Are castle? These? Yeah, yeah. What about these, Norm? These any good for you? These came out of a manor house they pulled down a village near here called Snorscum. Snorscum? Yeah, it's one of those funny English names. Well, they have possibilities. But what about this old piece? Well, it's not strictly old, Norm. These are the sort of things that we actually make. We use old components. This is an old door that we've cut down and made fit, made work. Really? The bottom down here is a chair rail. We've turned that upside down, put it on there. <laughs> Makes a great plinth. You're kidding. So this is architectural millwork made into a piece that looks like an antique. That's what we do, Norm. Really? Well, you know, I could see this in a bank in Texas or maybe a hotel lobby in California. Yeah. Come through. We'll get a lot more through here. Simon, where do you get all this stuff? We buy it all over the place, all over the country, Europe. How about this? This, for example, came out of Scotland. These columns, do you? Really? Wow, they're wonderful. I wish I could use them, but I think I'd have to modify the whole flat. <laughs> now, what's this? It looks like you've got a room within a room. I mean, back here, it looks like a set, scenery. But these are real wood panels? Yeah, it came out of a chateau in France. They just keep pulling them down, and we keep buying them up. Wow. Another piece made from salvage? Yep. Shutters as doors, architrave as, cor as cornice. Hmm. Oh, but surely this is an antique. No, Norm, never existed. We've put it together, bits and pieces again. Really? And you do all the finish and gold leaf right here? Yeah, that's all in the workshops. It's wonderful. Well, now, Simon, this table, I can imagine many a monk dining at. It must be old. Well, Norm, the floorboards that we made the top from are old. This is made from floorboards? Sure is. Is nothing sacred? Nothing. <laughs> now, what's the story with this room that you've set up? <laughs> well, we bought this in the flea market in Paris as a pile of wood. We were just going to use it for bits and pieces for the furniture. Sorted it out. It's a room. We thought we'd sell it as it is. It's great. <laughs> hey, Norm, how about these columns? Any good? Yeah, you know, this is getting a little bit closer to what I could use. Well, before you actually make your mind up, I've got another pair upstairs. I think you should take a look at those. OK. Well, Simon, I can imagine that right about now, my wife, needless to say, our viewers are going to be asking, are any of these pieces that you make available in the United States? Yeah, actually, about 85% of our sales are to America. Really? Uh, can anyone buy them? We sell only to the trade. We don't deal direct to the public. But uh, we're pretty well represented right across the country. So if I want one of these pieces, I just see my local antique dealer. Yeah, that's about it. Right. Well, what's this? This is terrific. Well, these are, these are really the sort of thing that we made our name for. A bookcase put together, again, out of reclaimed pieces, but very practical. Middle take a television, I see. designed specifically for that. And uh, if you need to get it upstairs or you're in an apartment building or something, breaks down into six pieces, piece of cake to move. Wow, that's great. Oh, now, are these the columns you wanted me to see? Yeah, these are they. We did these in our workshop. You made these in your workshop? Yep. Can I see the shop? Yeah, sure. Well, Norm, this is like our spare parts department. We uh, 
the stuff comes in, it's stripped, then we rack it here, all ready for use. Easy access, you can grab it all out the racks dead easy. Bits of pilaster, skirting board that'll end up as a plinth. Bit of carved architrave there, that was an old door surround. So you take a shopping cart in the list and just cruise down the aisle and pull it all exactly. up? Exactly, exactly. Wow, look at this, all the hand-carved pieces. Yeah, all this stuff really is like the icing on the cake. It's what makes the furniture really special. Right, Norm, this is one of four workshops we have here. Mm -hmm. And Martin here is putting together a cornice, so you can see exactly how we use these, all these bits of wood that you see around. We start off, these are bits of old architrave and door and chair rail. And we just trim them, tilt them slightly, and then we put this backing in because that gives you a straight flat edge, easier to cut the mitres on the saw. Finally, a capping on the top. There's your cornice. Boy, could have fooled me. Looks, Looks good. Great. Yeah. The next stage from there, that's put onto here, and when it's all trimmed out, blocked out properly, you've got this, which is ready for finishing. And can I see how you put the finish on? Sure. Follow me. Well, Norm, this is the finishing shop. The stuff comes in here from the carpenters. It's sanded, steel walled, stained, and finally it gets a couple of coats of wax. And a lot of hand rubbing. That's right. It's uh, the only way to really get the finish. You do it right, it turns out like this. Well, it's beautiful, and I've got to give you a lot of credit because it's amazing how you've taken all this old architectural millwork that we've been throwing away for years and make these wonderful pieces. But where do you get all the ideas? Well, Norm, some of it's custom built. Some of it we just adapt from designs from the past. And some of it, like this piece here, this is a faithful reproduction of an original Delfrac that is in my parents' home. Really? That's where we sent Steve, so he gets to see the original. Exactly. Well, Ted, the place is absolutely fabulous. I'm glad you like it because it's slightly different today than when we bought it. It had uh, been used as a sawmill and uh, all the debris had been thrown out in the garden. There was no garden here at all. It was yeah. full of metal and saw blades, lorry bodies, tires, just dreadful. Well, you'd never know it looking at the place now. It looks like it's been built in several sections, really. The one on the right seems to be newer than the bit on the left. Well, that's very observant of you. It's actually a complete development of an English country house with a wing for every century mm -hmm. since, since 1450. 1450, yeah. So this wing here is the Victorian wing, which was built in 1860 um, by Salvin, who also was involved in the building of Buckingham Palace. Mm. And now this is the medieval wing, which is 1450. And this particular piece, the condition was reasonable, but the bit we're approaching now was unbelievable. We had trees that were 30 foot high growing from inside the house. They followed the light through the windows, which had no glass in. No kidding. And these actually were the early parts of the house and the early kitchen to here. So perhaps if we go through now, we can, I can show you the kitchen, which uh, we've now converted. Wow. Do you like it? <laughs> What an amazing kitchen. I'm glad you like it. If you can just imagine what it would have been like four or five hundred years ago, this was a working kitchen that fed maybe 100, 150 people that worked on the estate. So um, all the cooking would have been done in this space here? All in that space there. Yeah. But in fact, this is only half the space, and they would have probably roasted a whole cow on this at a time. Holy smokes. With enormous spits and various compartments. Look at the stonework from these arches. These How old are, is this? These are Norman. 11th century, these pillars. And standing and these here all this time. All this time. And this is the other half of the fireplace. My and the centre wall was never there. This was totally open. So you can imagine the size of this. So it was sort of a fireplace room. People could Complete walk inside. Complete room of a fire, yeah. What an amazing place. Now, what was the condition of this room when you started? Well, this room was uh, much the same as most things. The, the ceiling, the ceilings were washed through the, because the, it was exposed to the the, the elements. elements and the lovely stone walls that you see now are exposed because the water washed all the plaster off. Mm -hmm. of and the timber work? And the timber work was painted and we had to have this sandblasted. In fact, all the timber throughout the house that you see, these beams as well, have all been sandblasted. 
Well, the house itself is an eyeful. But the furnishings, I would say, I'm jealous. I covet them. They are really wonderful. What, what's this combination here? This is one of my favorite pieces. We rescued it from the worm, only yeah. just. Yeah. And it's about 1850. How about this one here? Base. And this one's about 1820, a little Delphrac that was actually made just to display plates. Mm. Wonderful collection. Mm. Well, we managed to keep few things anyway. Yeah. We don't sell everything. <laughs> <laughs> wow. The dining room, huh? Incredible. 20 of your most intimate friends can sit here, dine, and gaze out over this incredible landscape. And the ceilings. What are they, pla a cast plaster? No, well, most of it's handmade plaster. Yeah. That we only had 15% left after the rain had finished with it. And, uh, but there was enough of the pattern that we could copy it. Wow. And it goes on in here. And the same in this room. This is the same story. You know, the scale is just unbelievable. I mean, what would these rooms have been used for? These were the ballrooms in the Victorian times. Yeah. So they were always very grand rooms. Mm. This piece? And this is one of our creations again, made from old components. Hmm. Now, surely these must have been the most majestic rooms of the house. Hmm, I think uh, if you have time, maybe there's one more room we should look at. Right, Steve, this is the room I really wanted you to see. We call it the hall. The hall? We're not quite sure what Henry VIII called it. Henry VIII? Mm hmm. This was built for the visit of Henry VIII to the house with his entourage in 1537. How long did he stay? Well, six months or whenever the food ran out, whatever there was the sooner. <laughs> but, but, the, but the roof, I mean, you see stuff like that in cathedrals, but not in private homes. Well, this again was lost. Uh, they, the sawing machines that were in this hall when it was uh -huh. a sawmill shook the roof loose. They chainsawed it off, threw it down by the lake. Mm. And one of the mounds that we discovered when we were doing the garden was this roof. And as you can see from the fragments, we managed to salvage a few fragments hmm. that gave us the patterns to copy the roof. Amazing. What about this bay here, this nave? Yes, that's a wonderfully untouched ceiling with the Tudor Rose of England. So that's original? That's original. We didn't have to even touch that apart from painting. Well, that was lucky. And the stained glass? And the stained glass is a copy of the original, which is in the Burrow Collection in Glasgow. And the curator from the Barrow Collection supplied us with all the working drawings mm -hmm. for us to reconstruct that glass with old components. Mm. It looks original. I mean, mm. I, I don't think that That's you That's what tell. they say. They say that it's so well done that unless you knew about stained glass, you wouldn't know that that was reproduction. Well, I got to tell you, Ted, this is an astonishing place. And I suspect you have spent a lot of time and a considerable <laughs> fortune in uh, restoring it. But uh, it is one of the great national treasures of England. And I just want to thank you for showing us around. Well, it's been fun. And uh, it's been fun doing the house. And we're pleased to show it to you. Thank you for coming. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, Norm, after all that, you never did tell me if you found a <laughs> uh, column to help hide this poster. Well, actually, I found a couple that might work. And I took some photos. And when they get developed, we'll show them to Carla and Jeremy and let them decide. Sounds good. Boy, the new tools just keep on coming, don't they? <laughs> oh, that's right. Here's one of them. You've seen a nail gun like this before. I have. It doesn't require any air. Right. It has an internal combustion engine and a fuel cell, except the ones we've used before shoot common nails and finished nails. This one shoots drywall nails. Hmm. Boy, the drywall hangers must love that. I think they're going to. The nails just load in like a regular nail gun. Make sure the spring is against it, and we'll give mm -hmm. it a try. Just turn on the fan, put it in position. Boy, that is great. Can I give it a shot? Sure. Well, it's not light, I can tell you that, but... Hey, terrific. All right. Very nice. Well, I got another one I want to show you. This, I'm told, is the only one existing in Great Britain at the moment. Mm-hmm. Feel it. Boy. It weighs nothing. Super light. And this is also a drywall nailer. And this one shoots a clip of nails yeah. like this. And you see they have a little concave right. head, and that will hold the mud a lot better than a flat head. Hey, you know where I've seen this before? Over in Japan, in the modular housing factory, they were using the same tool. Remember I brought you a couple of nails? That's right, you did, and they yeah. had this concave head. Well, let's see this one work. Right, now this one uh, does run on the air. That is slick. Let me give it a shot. You figure a nail holds just as well as a screw? Oh, 
states long before there were drywall screws, all of this was installed with nails. And with the ribs on the nail, there's no problem. Okay, looks like Finn's got a new tool too. He does. Hey Finn. Hi, how are you? New uh, tool? Yes. What's this all about? This is a multi-purpose saw. Um, I'll show you how it works. Let me just unplug this first. As you saw, it did the conventional chop. Yeah. Straight Nine down. Degrees. Okay. Um, we can uh, also cut just flat angle. All right. Set so it does up. miters. Yeah. I'm just setting it Also. There. And we can also do bevels too. Bevels yeah. as well at the does same those. time. And the compounds. So what's the big deal? <laughs> I mean, well, that's pretty standard. Well, that's one position. We just set this down like so. Clip that in there. And then, hey, presto. Hey, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a table it's saw. Up. You like it? It's a lovely piece of kit. Yeah? Yeah. The crew likes it? Yep. We've we found plenty of uh, uses for it. All right. Well, I'll leave your gentlemen to your toys, uh, tools. Uh, <laughs> let me check in with Carla, who's just come onto the site. Try to cheer her up a little bit. Okay. Cheers. Well, Carla, with all the changes, do you still think you'll have a kitchen that's big enough for you? Well, we're both big people, but um, we really don't have much choice, Steve. You so. don't. That's true. Well. Well, where's your husband? I always had to take a second job to pay for all this. Come on. <laughs> no, actually, he's under the weather, but yeah. it's flu. Yeah. Um. Well, look, I'm interested in how you selected among the three options that you had. Well, it wasn't easy, but um, the first option we quickly discarded because that meant bringing it back to as it was when we started, mm -hmm. and we would have lost far too much space. The second one, we would have lost the roof deck. Right, because they have to build that false roof. That's right. And as you know, every square foot in London is expensive. Mm -hmm. So to protect our investment, we want to keep that. Mm -hmm. So we're left with a third one. Makes perfect yeah. sense. Well, if it's any consolation, Carla, I did find a couple columns to hide those posts. Great. <laughs> Progress. And next time, we'll see your kitchen cabinets being fabricated, right? That's right. We're going to make a visit to a town known as Devizes, and we're going to see your cabinets being made. So until then, I'm Steve Thomas. And I'm Norm Abram. For this old house. Funding for this old house is provided by... Parks Corporation, makers of safe and simple, environmentally responsible stains and finishes that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by State Farm Insurance, keeping our promise of protection with auto, home, life, and health insurance. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. This is PBS. Steve Thomas's book, This Old House Kitchens, can be ordered by calling 1-800-441-3000. Fully illustrated with photos and drawings, this soft cover reference presents every aspect of kitchen design and construction. The price is $24.95 plus handling. Please have your credit card ready. The book is also available in bookstores and libraries nationwide.